Awesome. Thank you all for coming this evening to hear uh, Dr. Pardo talk about his work on villages and environmental water using archaeology for conservation on the Murray River. Uh, firstly, Cass and Carl would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we meet here today, the Ngunnawal and the Nambri, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement and thanks to any First Nations Australian person in this room and either on Zoom or here physically. And also those people and communities who have provided such valuable contributions to the work that Colin will talk about today. Uh, before I introduce Colin, there's just a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, you know, it's really nice to see everyone in person again, but again, it is COVID time. So if you'd like to wear your mask, the whole please do. Um, we have hand sanitizer down here, but mostly thank you for not coming if you're not feeling unwell, if you're feeling unwell. Uh, we will have Colin's talk and then afterwards we'll have all the questions. So save up all the goodies for it afterwards. Um, also, on because this is a Zoom, a hybrid delivery, uh, it is being recorded. So just be aware that if you have questions at the end, you will be recorded. And also for those that are on Zoom, um, please keep your microphones on mute, which would be awesome. Um, and if you do have your video on, again, it is recorded. Uh, so I'm particularly excited to hear about this talk because it is both archaeological and environmental. So this work also helps to provide information for the past to help influence government policies today and you know, um, understand what the landscape was and could be again. So Colin Pardo is a biological anthropologist and archeologist who studies the links between people from bio the biology of bones to the culture of trade in ground stone tools. He spends most of his time on archeology span of the Murray-Darling Basin. And since retiring from commercial archeology, span Colin helps with the archeology span in service of conservation. He is a member of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies and is a life member of the Australian Archaeological Association and the Australian Association of Consulting Archaeologists. Um, I mean, as a note, I mean, as I've been working on projects in Southwest and New South Wales, I have heard many First Nations people talk very fondly of Colin. So it's very exciting that he can be here today. Uh, can you please put your hand together and welcome Colin with me. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you very, very for those very kind words. Um, I'll figure this out in a minute. Um, so happy to be back. Yeah. Oh, do I stand there? Because people are looking at me. Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I will. Uh, uh, today's presentation is on behalf of uh, uh, actually quite a large and dedicated team. Uh, the Barapa representatives send their greetings to one and all. And uh, throughout the talk, I'll, I'll emphasize that at the heart of this presentation are um, intellectual property rights embodied in a Barapa archaeological record. Um, and I'm only going to emphasize it because it's relevant for their aspirations in the stewardship of land and water in work and jobs. Um, Okay, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Yeah, take once here, and then it would. Uh, right? Yeah. yeah, there we go. Okay, good. Uh, so, just to place ourselves, the Barapa are one of the large tribes of the eastern plains uh, west of the dividing range. And I'll be using a fair bit of LIDAR, which is um, magic. But it's a, it's a false color elevation. Um, basically, the laser scans the ground and uh, magically gets rid of all the vegetation and that you fair earth. And really, you don't want to go anywhere without it. You know, it's such a wonderful thing. Uh, and this is the area. It's uh, an area of state forest on the Murray River. That's all right. Okay, you can flow. Oh, I don't understand that. Uh, and it's that way down in the southeast. I'll be talking about these various sites, but mainly I'll be talking about Pollock Swamp to start with, and the Murray River snaking through there. Here's a, a bit more of a close up. The Kundrick Paracuta State Forest, of which 
Pollock Swamp is at the downstream end. Is um, it's an icon site for the Murray Darling Basin Authority. It's Ramsar listed. Uh, it's also not in the best shape. Um, to set the scene for those that you don't know the area, about 80% of the water in the Murray Darling Basin is taken for irrigation. And that actually turns out to be more for the Murray River. And um, we're looking at smaller and smaller chunks of water being kept for irrigation, I mean, for environmental purposes. But it does supply 40% of Australia's uh, agricultural produce, feeds, um, feeds roughly 250 million people. So it's not a, an inconsiderable thing. The lands of the Parappa, uh, I always find kind of really interesting. It's one of the two things that I knew about Australia when I arrived here was Kahuna, which is a tiny little no account town. It doesn't even make it on the map, just up here. And, uh, but uh, some ancient Scalita remains, the uh, most ancient Scalita remains at the time were discovered in the 1920s formed a major part of evolutionary thinking and our views and um, models of modern human evolution. Places like Cow Swamp and Kabul gave us an indication of what, what life was like in, in the Ice Age. Uh, if you really want to think about life in the Ice Age and the transition to the Holocene, looking at the biology of the people is probably more instructive than anything else, but sadly those days are gone. Um, it was an area of early excavation of things like earth mounds. Uh, the earliest actually was down where Liz Williams did her work earlier on, but this is fairly early in the scheme of things and an understanding of settlement patterns developing out of that and informed people from uh, people like T Norman Tyndale right through to currently uh, um, Bruce Pascoe with Dark Emu. So we've got Cow Swamp, places like Cow Swamp. This is just a bit of a, an overview. Looking to these big flat lakes, big open country, probably always open country, uh, the earliest um, drawings of the area and the earliest um, accounts seem to indicate that it was always open country, but there's, there's forest uh, belts along the place. Um, in terms of settlement, earth mounds are a pretty interesting indicator of settlement because they are places that people come back to exactly the same spot year after year. And these are the well-recorded areas of, of earth mound distributions in the Southeast. They're all river-based, they're all uh, wetland associated, they're all um, fairly dense in that sense. You, when, when you find one mound, you find heaps of them. And I'll be showing some of that as we move along. Um, Over the last several years, we've uh, used the distillation of this traditional knowledge to examine settlement patterns based more or less on the earth mounds. There's, there's other ancillary evidence around these things, such as scarred trees, burials, and so on. Um, uh, some culturally modified soils around the place. But uh, we concentrated on a large swamp called Pollock Swamp. Uh, but just before I get into that, I thought just a bit of, of situation of what the water situation is. So there's an average seasonal flow uh, during the summertime. This is mainly predominated by, uh, by winter rains. And so summertime, not so much rain. 
late winter and spring, the waters start to rise. And the green, of course, is green or the red is, you know, not so good. And so you get this seasonal flow and the waters come in and start to peak. And then as the summer progresses, they stop and anything that will hold water is sitting there during the summer. The main flood keeps on going and the then um, evaporation takes hold and draws the water down. The water offtake refers to how much water is being drawn off for irrigation. So from the 20s, when structures start really getting in in a big way, um, the 20s is a time of, of building uh, lots of regulators, lots of weirs. The river is, is more or less dammed at various positions. Cruises along, and you can see a big bump here. Post Second World War, things take off again, and we we cross that point of uh, allocating more water than there was, because you know that's the way to go. Uh, it's been clawed back a little bit, but you can see that it basically it's hit its limits. The more more water can be taken and. Eventually, I think the crux of this is going to be all that water will be taken, you know, and I'm not looking for policy. I'm not looking for allocations or anything. I'm looking for um, holding on to a few drops of water is what we're talking about for environmental purposes, because all these policies, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but the policies are based on either idealized notions of, oh, we've got lots of water, like right now, we've got lots of water, right? Everybody's oh, fine, fine, everything's great, you know, we've got lots of water. Um, we've got allocations, we can give you all the environmental water you want. You don't need environmental water today. You need it in 2019, you need it in 2018. Um, but I'll back off that a bit. Um, I, just put in the Federation drought and the Millennium drought, you can see that this is a more accurate representation. This is also in channel flows. So this is not telling you anything about the wetlands. It's not telling you anything about the supporting structure of the, really the ecology that supported Aboriginal people and, uh, and, and is, is, kind of the thing that a lot of things need to live in. A lot of things don't live in the main channels, but there you have what looks like a very punishing system. There's still a bit of water coming through. You know, there's always a bit of rain, but this is in channel. There's nothing out in the, in the wetlands. That's ameliorated because uh, about two or three years worth of water is held by the various dams on the system. And so the Millennium Drought doesn't look so bad. Uh, in fact, I refer to the Millennium Drought as a killing drought. Um, I was over in Western New South Wales working with Bakanji and a couple of others, uh, 2018, 2019, 2017, and you progressively watched every single thing die. It all goes. And you know, you look at that and you think, well, that's hard. That's very hard. Um, but I'm um, gonna keep moving here. Uh, okay, this is just a um, again to situate ourselves, to remind ourselves where conservation is at. And this is a weird one because blue is red. Orange and red is dry. Uh, this is fairly recent. This is uh, early in the summer, early in this last summer. And there's a study here. There's Kundrakura State Forest, and it's red. And oh, there's another state forest, and it's red. Oh, and there's another one, and it's red. And there's another one, and it's red. And there's another one, and it's red. Um, the water goes out, it's distributed around the joint. Uh, irrigation goes on, you can see all the little blocks. Uh, but 
when we talk about conservation and we talk about places that we think we're putting our conservation efforts into, which is public lands, that seems a bit backwards, but that's what, it, that's what you've got. And that's what we're facing is ideologies of conservation that up until now have been talking about maintaining a healthy forest. And I will be talking about a different approach. Um, bit of talk about the Darling River in recent years. Um, if you wanted to know where all the water was going at the beginning or during that killing drought, these are the water harvesting um, paddocks for, for the cotton farming that goes on at the headwaters, Queensland border kind of area, part of the river over here. Um, you know, but, but we wear cotton, so you know. Um, okay, I'm going to move now oh, on to something that is getting close to what I want to talk about, which is a place that we went to um, several years ago. We knew that there was, there was some stuff there. Uh, thought of going to have a look at it. It's called Pollock Swamp. I started, I was writing a paper on this, and, and I thought, Pollock Swamp, who is this Pollock? Uh, so you ask around the joint, and, and this is, no, no. No, don't know anybody. No, neither a last name nor from Poland. Uh, and then I was looking through Louise Perkis's dictionary, and Pulich is the Barapa word for swamp. And this, I think, is probably one of those situations where somebody says, What's the name of that place? And the Barapa person says, Oh, that's Pulich. Like swamp. And he says, All right, that's Pulich swamp. Okay, so that's Pollock. And then it becomes Pollock swamp. So it's swamp swamp. Um, floodplain, you can see uh, these are all trees. Um, a bit of open water just in there. There's bigger channels here, and you can see this, this capillary, these capillary beds of little tiny channels that go through the forest. They anastomose, they, they're part of the flood system. And uh, we thought it'd be interesting to have a look around. This is what it looks like today, you know? And I boast, because everybody else does the work, I you know, just don't look at the work now and stuff. But I boast, and nobody has knocked me back on this, that this is the best conservation effort on the whole Murray River. And it's used probably the least amount of water. But this is a regeneration of the central portion of the swamp with, uh, we just thought, oh yeah, it's just kangaroo grass, wallaby grass, you know? And then all of a sudden one of them says, oh my God, it's the rare wallaby grass, so we've got to do stuff. These are reestablishing themselves uh, at their own pace. Uh, giant sedges, rushes, grasses, uh, water ribbons, a whole variety of plants are establishing themselves with an understory, which, uh, we're going to take out in the middle of the swamp. We're going to take out most of this understory because it, it wasn't, it wouldn't have been there historically. And river red gums, they're kind of weeds. They're nice, but and they're trees, you know. And like I probably hug more trees than anybody else because when you do scarred trees, you measure scarred trees and you need to measure their girth. So you, you get a tape measure. So you hug the tree when you mention, so it's, but there are weeds. So uh, in some instances, they don't belong there. But many of these swamps do ha did have a canopy of mature trees, very widely spaced that provided kind of a nice canopy under which all this stuff, and this is all come back uh, as it gets inundated annually. It, a lot of these will dry off, die off, uh, when the water recedes. We documented them very simply. We don't um, uh, do a huge amount, you know, like length, width, height, location. 
anything visible on the surface. Um, a bit of investigation because there are traps for young players. There are things which are not earth mounds, but which look just like earth mounds. Um, typically a, a giant old red gum. Full of termite mound stuff in the middle. Gets hit by lightning, the whole thing burns in place. Creates this huge mound that's got all this burnt clay and, and charcoal and all that. And you think, well, that's a mound, but you can tell fairly quickly. And you don't have to do much in the way of determination. It's a matter of just seeing what the soils are like and getting down to the soils. Uh, so, teams uh, originally looking at uh, the mounds and mapping them. We mapped 154 of these mounds around this, this place. Um, now, sometimes, if you get there at the right time of the year, you don't have to do a darn thing to do your survey work, you, unless you're colorblind. All you have to do is look for the purple, because Patterson's Curse, also known as Lachlan Valley Bluebells or Salvation Jane, is, uh, is very, very fond. It's an invasive species, one of those things that likes this kind of stuff. And because the soils are mildly hydrophobic, because they're, they got a lot of, um, well, they're highly organic. They got a lot of charcoal in them. But you, you don't just call it like grease from and oils from, from the cooking. Because earth mounds largely are the result of uh, cooking ovens dig an oven in the ground, like a honey for, for uh, the New Zealanders amongst us. And uh, you use uh, baked clay heat retainers and you put them in the, the oven. And I guess oils from the food, but anyway, the place is, is mild and hydrophobic. So not many trees grow on them, trees grow around the edges. Uh, but invasive species like Corham and Patterson's Curse will grow. And you see them on earth mounds and on levees, on the river levees. So, kind of where we got to was, um, was thinking, we've got this amazing place. And we've got this swamp, and we've got we've got this thing called environmental water allocations. So we put in for some environmental water, and uh, they they the MDBA provides uh, inundation models. So they they model how the water is going to go and how much water you're going to need. And I'm not going to go through all that because that was uh, a learning lesson for them. But uh, the, the original allocation was entirely insufficient. They said, oh, you'll need 500 megaliters. And I forgot to put up my, um, my translation thing, but a megaliter is big. Um, there's two and a half megaliters in an Olympic swimming pool. And I forget how many gigaliters there are in Sydney Harbor, but you know, there's several gigaliters in Sydney Harbor. Um, we ended up getting uh, a gigaliter. And what impressed the modelers at the MDBA was that we said, well, your model's wrong. They said, well, no, we have a model. Come on, guys, we got a model. <laughs> this is wrong. Uh, it's wrong in, in uh, not account. There's certain things you couldn't account for and certain things that you would think maybe we'd account for. Um, soil moisture, for instance, you would think, come on, guys, you account for that. But we had the archaeology. We had these earth mounds. We knew they were right beside the water. And we were there and we could see it. We could see the map of the distribution, which I'll show you shortly, of the sites. And we said, well, water has to go to these places. And your inundation model isn't showing that. So uh, they, 
went back, scratched their heads. They also have errors because there's little block banks put in and little levees put in, you know, places mucked around a bit. But in the end, they're very taken with this because now they have a data point or, or, or a set of data which provides them um, very good basic evidence on where their inundation should be. So anytime they find archaeology like this, they know that their inundation model has to match the archaeology. So they're actually quite happy with that, and, you know, ferret away down in the basement somewhere with a supercomputer and doing whatever they're doing. Uh, we put this in in 2015 and we got ended up with a gigaliter. The total for the forest was going to be 25 gigaliters for the whole forest. So, you know, it's hard times. There wasn't a lot of water around. We, were, we had to struggle for it. Um, but the thing with these things is that you're playing God. And you're playing God in a way which is all very easy if you are just back there and you don't visit the place, you don't see it. But this environmental water allocation that they put in in 2015, uh, which was several government departments, consigned to death a whole generation of birds because they didn't put in enough, they didn't count on how it should be done. And the thing is that the birds, birds have only a few generations that they're gonna have successful breeding. And these are colonial water birds largely. They're coming in, they're having a look around, they have to make a decision. And they don't make a decision like, everything looks good, we'll do it now. They've got to make their decisions early on because they've got to go through courtship, nest building, rearing, fledging, and the water has to last until the birds can leave. And if you don't get that amount of water for that length of time, then you have killed all those chicks. They're gonna all die. And that's what happened in that year, except for Pollock Swamp. Um, because we've been working on doing it according to that seasonal flow and I'll bore you with that later. But um, I'll just pull back from all that stuff now. And uh, just give you a little map of the distribution of the sites. And these are uh, one of those little GIS um, fixtures where you just plot it according to the relative size of the, of the mound. So the area of the mound relates to the size of the dog. And you get a picture of a fairly dense um, suburbs and streets, if you will. Uh, you can call them what you like, but, uh, but you know, they're nice to look at as streets. Um, they form little clusters. They are by obviously the most secure water, but people have also made secure water. And I'll just go, um, yeah, you can read that one. So you think real estate, you know, like nothing changes for all, I'm a universal humanist, so you know, I don't think that's the same. And so real estate doesn't change. And the best real estate is going to have the nicest houses. Did yesterday, did today, and apparently it did um, three and a half thousand years ago as well. This is right at the junction uh, here. So this is the outlet, and it's a big lagoon. And there's a whacking great. Uh, now there, and one on this side as well. And this is just a dot of them all. Uh, this is the northern end of that swamp. So you can see on the LIDAR, the, what color is that? Purpley. Excuse me, color, is that a LIDAR? This is all LIDAR, and this is 
lower, lower elevation. So this purple is lower, blue is higher. And the nice thing with LIDAR is you get all different colors all the time because the lamp, lamp varies a bit. So this is the edge of the swamp up here. You can see mounds dotted around them. And some of these mounds have different things in them. So there's a bit of probably um, differential resource use in them. And that's that big down there. You can see snaking up the lagoon there. Um, look, when you're there, it, 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 you can't help but think that it's a street. You know, there's the houses. They're situated, to a degree they have to be situated um, near little side channels, little runners. So there's a bit of determination about where they are. But their placement, you start to look at and you think, maybe they just like to alternate so they've got a clear view across and they're not looking straight at their neighbors. You led to those sort of things. Two little runners here with a little area in the middle that when you're at, you can't help but think, gosh, that's a really nice little place. It's all, you can keep it all bare, you can keep an eye on the kids, you can say to the kids, you can't go outside of here. Big enough for a bit of footy. This is Marin Group country. So um, one of the precursors that relates to Celtic football, which hybridizes to become AFL, or Australian rules, I should say. Um, and these, these dots the mounds, and you can see on, on the slider, you can see the blue. Um, some of these mounds are obvious. They're, they're not all that hot, you know, but they pick up on this. These uh, lighter purpley dots, pinky dots, are little depressions. And those are not natural depressions. Those are ponds. Those are dug ponds. And uh, to my embarrassment, uh, I was going along and I was trying to take a picture of one of these mounds. And I thought, because oh, yeah, they're terrible to take pictures of. They're horrible to take pictures of. They look like nothing. They, you know, you take these great pictures and they're dirt. <laughs> and, and you think, it's just this, you know? You find this crap. Uh, um, so, I thought, oh, what can I do about that? Um, so I got down and I saw this hollow. So I got down this hollow and I got this picture. Oh, that's better. That's, you know, because they're up higher and I can see it. And I'm looking around. And like, what am I doing in this hole in the ground? It's as big as this <laughs> room. What, what is a hole like this doing in a tiny little channel? Like, what the heck? And then one of those, you know, bang. And you realize, because we all know you get this clay and make the clay baked clay through the ovens. And you don't think, you, you just, well, you just grab clay. You just randomly get still and grab the clay from whatever. Uh, but of course you're not. Of course you're not. You're going to dig it from the same place. And once you get started, and you realize, I've just increased my asset here. These things are now deep enough to give you a year and a half water supply, should all things go bad. Um, and I'll get ahead of myself again, because I'm completely disorganized for this talk, as you can imagine. Well, as you can tell, <laughs> as you can tell. Yeah. But um, last week, we, we do a lot of monitoring, and the monitoring I'll come back to it again. But we do targeted monitoring to help work out how we're gonna do this year after year. Because you have to do this year after year. You can't say to the little birds, you're not getting any water this year, so fuck off. <laughs> you can't do that. You, all those little fish, you know? These, these little fish that are going extinct, that have gone extinct under our watch, one went extinct, the Macquarie Pygmy Perch. <clears throat> I don't know anything about these little fish. I, 
I'll come back to that. Uh, but they're little, they're little guys, you know, just little guys. Um, they put a net in just because we because we do this, we get this environmental water. And then we think, let's push the water out and see what happens in these ponds. So we did, we got a little extra water this year, and we pumped it into these guys, and in one little net, uh, not me, but the others, pulled out three kilos of white bait in one little go. So three kilos of white bait at, I could probably sell probably about 80 bucks a kilo to a restaurant, sell as an entree, you know, when you go and buy white bread at a restaurant. Um, you're talking, you know, serious, serious resource, money wise. Um, anyway, I, I digress. Uh, this is the southern entrance. This is actually the entrance to the, uh, to the swamp. The swamp's up here. And you can see it's a bit deeper. You can see the same arrangement. It looks like a street. It also looks suspiciously like that is unproblematically a uh, pond. That you're very suspicious of. That little thing up there, which we've been looking at, those are mounds around it. There, we've been looking at, and it turns out to be a little pond. And it turns out to be a few mounds. And until you see it flowing, you have no idea what those characters are doing. Look at it and think, are you like the last people in and you just got no more real estate? Or are you kind of fit and you didn't think about where you were going to live? Or my current favorite is I can't stand the teenagers around anymore. So. <laughs> Off you go live over there. You're out of you're out of your trouble. But that is a pond up there. Um, back to this one. This whole channel has two deep stretches along it. I'm suspicious that that channel has a lot of digging in it as well. Um, but that's kind of unknowable. So you get. Um, you get a place that also has perhaps the best historical record anywhere of hunter-gatherers in their core territory, uh, uh, which is a kind of whole little talk in itself. But uh, this, this to me is your bog ordinary hunter-gatherer. This is, we're, we're, we're a river species, we've evolved to rivers. This is where we live. And the historical record here is sensational. It's amazing. Uh, like I said, it's informed a huge number of people. I think for a historical record about hunter-gatherers, or fisher hunter-gatherers, or whatever the heck you want to call it, uh, anywhere in the world, untouched by agriculture, uh, this is it. Now here's a picture from the 1860s from a bloke who was on the Glandowski expedition and actually did all the work, a guy called Craig. And he did all these sketches and they get filtered through like his sketching and then they go to Germany where a lithographer does them and then they get changed and that. And you know, you get all that sort of stuff, like trees maybe on it exactly, but I think it's pretty good though. Really. But I look at this and I see a weir. You see fish, you see a coolerman, you see, you know, the sort of standard. But I see a pond right here. I see a little runner, a little channel. I see a pond. I see mounds. I see the housing. And I think these are the housings that you would see at, at a mound. I see them opposite either side, the weir, the weir like that, which when the water's pumping, it's not just like, I know there should be a weir there, it's like the weir has to be right there. It has to be, the weir has to be 
right there. And that's palm behind. Um, and, and then you get a taste for it, you know, <laughs> then you get a taste for it. You think, come on, let's just give this a crack. So uh, a couple of the youngsters, um, Diana and now I've had to check this several times, and it's not me. This her name is not Diana. Her name is Diana with an R in it. So that's not a typo. Um, they decided, well, let's have a crack. Let's have a crack. Let's see how we go. And um, you know, it's a first go, but not bad. And you can see what's happening here. And you think, all I have to do is put my little basket there. And I'm laughing. So uh, just as an aside, the enjoyment of engaging with your heritage um, in a way like this, in a big mashup of archaeology, conservation, fun, all that sort of stuff, appreciation. Um, there's a lot to like about it. Where am I? So oh, that's just a historical thing. Um, um, now I'm going to race through a few things because this is just boasting, really. But um, this is 1978. Uh, somebody decided they were going to plow this and put in a wheat crop, which didn't work very well. Because um, they just had a flood through. And they thought, oh, great, lots of water. Brilliant. And all that did was encourage the, the, the red gums. The red gums invaded, and that was the end of that. Uh, but we, we, the royal we, do monitoring. And it's a very important part to keep a track of not just the animals and plants, how they're progressing, uh, sort of ecological tick boxes of numbers and all that. We're looking for the diversity of animals and plants. They're, they're dumping uh, native fish into this place and into other places. And then checking, uh, they recently got a hold of 5,000 catfish, little fingerling catfish, chuck them in. So we're checking how they're doing. Are we getting um, progressions of that? Are we getting enough that, has anybody ever eaten catfish? It's great. It's great. You don't want the big ones, you just want small ones. Uh, dissolved oxygen, temperature, all these levels, all these things are important because you want the water to come in and then you want it to go away and you have to manage all that. This is not set and forget. This is, um, I didn't understand at all. I knew that there was this thing called interventionist conservation and non-interventionist conservation. I didn't realize it was a huge ideological battleground <laughs> in ecology. And I just dumbly you know, took archaeology. Oh, I'll just step in and do that. And, uh, and you think, wow, that's, that, people get really head up over this. But firmly interventionist. Um, and to cut to the chase, our work in all this, um, I think, has either we're either surfing on the wave of what was coming or we were partly responsible for it. But the ship of conservation in government is slowly turning around from non-interventions to interventions, from large scale, save the trees, to small scale doing this. And, and I think in no small part because they're seeing the results that cannot be duplicated here uh, anywhere else, but places like this, the way this is going. And you need, so instead of all the monitoring that goes on, which is checklists that derive places that, I've gone to some of these places and like it's a road crossing and there's never been anything there and there never will be anything there. And people drive by and they stop and they tick their box and say, oh, off they go. Uh, that kind of monitoring is useless. This kind of monitoring is guided towards next year. Um, so this is what we're looking at. Birds that are nesting that haven't been there for 30 years. On the right is the Nankin night heron. 
It's a weird looking bird, it's a migratory bird. It hasn't been there since 1996. These birds, these colonial water birds, they migrate here, up into China, up into Japan. You know, the Japanese love their cranes. Yeah, those are Barapa cranes. They breed in Barapa land, they're Barapa cranes. So the Japanese, they all love their cranes, but they don't breed up there. They're just having their summer holiday up there. I digress. Uh, Norman. Norman Moore is the descendant of a man uh, who was named in um, the 1800s and gave his name to the town of Daniloquin. And Daniloquin was uh, a well-regarded man. He was known to be big and strong. Norman is big and strong. Uh, Norman likes the fish. And in those, one of those little incidental things in archaeology that, that we all pillage and historians hate us for, they record that Daniloquin's totem, his personal totemic affiliation, you all know what totems are? Affiliations with the, the animal or plant world in a fictive kind of way, but social anthropologists love to write about it. Uh, Daniloquin, his totem was the Yabba Yabba. The Yabba Yabba is the name of my parent. Norman Moore is a direct descendant of Denuk, and that's his brother. Never saw him. Um, 1996, we went back with um, Norman. 2016, grown man crying. Grown man crying. Hadn't seen his brother for 30 years. Uh, these are a rare and endangered bird called a bittern of some sort. Uh, these are cute little cygnets that you just have to, that's a gorgeous picture of a bird in flight. Um, so I was, I was all taken with the, the birds, you know, oh, great God, it's water birds, the resources. Uh, and then the little fish kind of got onto the radar. There's a big variety of them. And you ask these funny questions like, uh, we started to think about them. Where do the little fish breed? So you start going through a few publications and you don't get anywhere. And then you ask a few fish people and they go on the flood plant somewhere. Um, Currently, we're, we're, what we're thinking is that um, you don't find these villages all over the place. You only find these villages in certain places, some for no good reason. One water body looks just as good as another. But Barapa and other peoples over, the, over thousands of years were making individual decisions year by year, deciding where they were going to go, putting their money where they're mouthfuls or whatever, um, but making decisions and then going back to the same place. And I think what we've hit is that these are actually the nurseries of the small fish. I think all these village sites are the nurseries of the small fish. And I don't think it's any surprise that when they do the monitoring, we get this. Now this is a whole bunch of Parakia, parakia, para something, krill. It's just a little shrimp. But there's a lot of fish in there, plus the shrimp that the little fish eat. Um, we get very few carp. We have very few other invasives. And this, they, they go back. Um, not all of them die. Some of them are sacrificed um, in other ways. But you can see the kind of yields that you would get, uh, even if Norman does, he's completely dismissive. You know, Why do you have to small fish? You know, <laughs> um, but this is what I come back to. And, you know, we all know about the fishing with nets in the river and, and, and diving for fish. And, you know, on the coast, it's all like I'm going spearing for fish and all that. 
Uh, one of the gang is heavily involved in uh, fish and WHO, World Health Organization. And they've got, they've been going around looking at third world traditional foods uh, in the transition to modern times, like damming of the Mekong, damming of the Irrawaddy, and uh, transition out of traditional foods. And what they're going on about is that the white bait, these small fish, turn out to be the best food in the whole wide world for the weanling period of children. They have, because you eat the whole thing. How much time do I have left? Oh, you're good, yeah. I'm good? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Um, I will stop. I will stop. It'll go really quickly after this. Um, they're the best food, because you eat the whole thing, and you eat the micronutrients from the bacteria in the gut, you eat all those micronutrients that are in the rest of the body, you get calcium directly from the bones, which are small and digestible, and the scales, which is probably the most digestible calcium you could possibly imagine. And what we do know is that weaning in hunter-gatherers is um, probably a more critical time. Well, it's, well actually, no, I'll take that back. In any human um, society, bar none, um, weaning has always been a critical time. Uh, mortality goes up at that point, morbidity goes up at that point, and you've, you, you've got things like some societies, children aren't given a real name until they've been weaned because you're kind of thinking, who's going to make it? Uh, and look at these nets. Now, these nets are worldwide. These little round nets are used worldwide. They're all used to get white bait, small fish. And here we are in a place where Kreft was just opposite us, kind of, on the, on the Victorian side. This could be the lagoon at Pollock Swamp, or it could be any, any of a number of places. Um, you can see that there's inundation, so that they're there when the water's a bit high. Look black, um, red belly black snake, the place is rotten with red belly black snakes. Uh, but they're really nice, and they, I didn't know this, but they, Trump brown snakes. So they'll kill brown snakes. And so you think, not that I've ever been bothered by snakes at all, but if you had a choice, well, I'll go with these guys. Um, and they just hang around, they just, you know, do the thing. So you get this picture, and where I was thinking lots of resources, lots of veg vegetation, because um, I haven't even hit that because I'm going so slowly. Um, we do do a bit of research, so conservation <laughs> research. A little cycle here. Australian smelt. They're not going to go for 80 bucks a kilo. They're going to be premium price as soon as we figure out how to separate out all <laughs> different ones. They are seriously young. Uh, there's plenty of other resources there as well. Uh, Zach here is holding a, a little tray of just to show you, uh, the kombunji is fairly young, but you can eat the young shoots. The rhizomes aren't really developed there. Um, uh, try Lachlan, try Lachlan, try something. Water ribbon, well known. Um, up in the territory, up in the Northern Territory in Kakadu, apparently it feeds the magpie geese. They love this stuff. And then you eat magpie geese because they're all fat. <laughs> this stuff. And then those, our clay balls that they made with the bank. Um, so there's plenty of resources. Uh, so um, we do that. We, we go around and we spruik this notion to people just to get environmental water allocations. And we've been getting an allocation every year for Pollock Swamp now for seven years. And we thought it'd be really nice just to go and do some more because our vision was that instead of pretending that you're going to have a big slab of water just to go in there and water the trees, it's like, forget the trees, you know, like really just forget the trees, let them go, let them go. We're, we're at that point where we have to make decisions in conservation. And 
Red gums aren't going to die out. Red gums will, there will be a red gum somewhere in Australia. But, I mean, they're all over the joint here, you know, with the thousands of them. Young, regrow. There's an old growth one, <coughs> quite large. Um, but these little fish, these colonial water birds, they're not, they're not all over the place. And they're not going to survive. They're not going to survive the next killing drought. When the darling dries up this time, we go into the next big drought. No little fish on the Darling River will survive because the Darling is now dead. That's where we're at. And so we thought if we can get little allocations, a couple of gigaliters for each of these little sites. Anyway, they fell for it. They gave us money for a survey. So we surveyed this chunk of the forest looking for other village sites. And it was a pilot study, thankfully fund, funded by Murray Darling Basin Authority, who um, we love, and Forestry Corporation, who we also love. And they, uh, they were interested to see how this would go. This is just one of those sites that we think, I just did it just to show you that there, you can't actually take a picture of an earth mound and see it. But what you can't see is the way the water is going to move through all this. You're in there and you sort of look around and you think, yeah, okay, maybe I'll put it back. This is the results. We, we documented, we've now documented eight villages, what I call villages, and eight hamlets uh, throughout the forest, mainly down the southern end because uh, in this uh, brown, red is higher and blue is lower. So that's just a natural slope of the basin. You know, like that's it's not very much, it's tiny, tiny amount. Um, you can see that there's a couple, and the big one on the bottom left there, little forest, is the one that we just started putting water into this year. Um, the gang documented 376 earth mounds in those areas. So this is not a trivial archaeological record. This is like shitloads of archaeology. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like that. <laughs> and you get, so this is a, a big channel, a big um, runner running through, very shallow, probably silted up quite a bit. There could be a meter and a half of silt in there. Don't know. But you'd like to know. You'd like to see what, what's going on in there. But we're busy doing what we're doing, which is documenting mounds. This is the other site that we documented just recently. And there's a couple of ponds. Those, those are dots. They're not the line art. Uh, I put the dots over top of the line art visitor so you can't actually see. But you can see a structure of mounds that is obviously determined by um, water and resource and land. So the real estate has to be at a particular ele elevation. It has to be at a particular distance from water. It has to be a particular distance from a kind of water. And the whole village has to be a particular distance from other resources, I guess. So that's the main Murray Channel in Black Bay. Uh, this small little street running down here, that's a levee uh, of a little old channel. You can see an old channel in that darker blue running there. And again, a levee just up here. Those are natural levees, yeah. Uh, and the mounds, they gave me some trouble, those bottom ones. Uh, but they are, they're, they're mounds, and there's a transition from, there's an archaeological record in the levees, because the levees build up, and people are living all along. So there's an archaeological record of individual events, as it were, all through levees, anywhere you go. Burials, ovens, hearths, culturally modified soils, stuff. Um, and then, you get these mounds as the levee stabilizes, I guess. You get these mounds developing on top of it. But again, they're not eroded. These aren't eroded 
from a, a culturally modified soil that's just been cut by erosion, maybe, they're, they're actual entities of themselves. Um, and the bigger ones are more obviously like that. Um, so we got an environmental water allocation too late for the birds. Uh, so we held off until the birds had decided to do something else. And so we didn't get any birds breeding in here. But uh, this was last December. And these are those two blue dots. These are those two ponds. And you can see they're just starting to fill. So the water has made its way all through this. And it's just coming along by there and it's starting to fill. And the earth mounds aren't really visible. You'd think they'd be really visible on, on drone imagery, but they're not so much. But the mounds, the ponds, really stand out. Um, um, so I get through all that, and then you think, um, oh, we're in the middle of all this sort of stuff. And you know, you know that there's this big bun fight on. Um, who would have thought kicked off by, by Bruce Pasco? And all of a sudden it's like you shat on my porch, you know, like really, Gus? Here I am just happily working away here, all the villages and all this stuff going on. Bruce Pasco, I was originally really ticked off. Oh man, the guy's gazumping, you know. Like he's taken like all that rich historical record and made this book. I'm like, come on, man. Really? Anyway, uh, I got over myself because he's a much better writer and he and he nailed it. He absolutely nailed it. And he did something which None of us, because there's many, many archaeologists who have written about this sort of stuff and talked about it. I don't know if you've listened to uh, Peter Sutton's uh, talk or, or his book. Uh, we got Liz Williams, who was writing about this not all that long ago in the scheme of things. Well, it doesn't seem long. 40 years ago. Okay, 40 years ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, but was writing on, on this sort of thing. Uh, these sort of things were unproblematic a couple of generations before that. Um, and then we get to this notion of, oh man, you can't call it a village because you're not an agriculturalist, because you're not settled, because you're not permanent, because you're not, you know, whatever. And I look at this place and, you know, you, you go to Polk Swamp, you go to Little Forest, you go to any of these places we looked at, and when I'm standing there, and when everybody that I work with is standing there, and you unproblematically see these streets, you unproblematically see these ponds, you, it doesn't take much to, for you to think, Grandpa's hip is shot. And he says, look, winter's coming. All you gang go off and do your thing in the back country, but I'm not going. I'm staying here. Grandma and I are just going to stay here. We'll hold the fort. They've got a year's supply of water those ponds, they've got fish in those ponds, they've got resources, they don't have to move far. Um, so there's people there probably all the time. Uh, but that's not the main thing. There's hundreds of people, 150 mounds. Um, let's say a quarter of them had people on them at any given time. So let's say 40, 40 residences, 40 households. And let's say you had, I don't know, five people per household. Um, oh, that's 200 people. That's not a bad size, you know, in the scheme of things. Uh, and that, so, I'm, I, you know, you don't have to deal with numbers. All you have to say is pretty much there have to be a couple of zeros. You know, there have to be that sort of scale of things. And so, as we learn more, we find that we do need to be more precise and, and more hopefully accurate in our terminology, and our words need to be clearly defined. Um, but at the risk of bothering everybody here with my little banging on about this, um, archaeology is not like other fields of study. As other fields develop, they talk among themselves using ever more abstruse terminology. 
And that's fine because they're not talking to us. They're not talking to you. Um, and you don't want to have a discussion with the people who are designing your TV. You know, you really just want to turn it on and watch it. Um, you don't want to deep and meaningful with a molecular geneticist necessarily. You just want to know about your vaccine, you know. Um, but archaeology belongs to the people. It's in the top three of what do you want to be when you grow up? So students particularly pay attention to this. This is your deepest responsibility in archaeology. When you go out, one out of three people that you meet wanted to be an archaeologist when they were a kid. And they're going to interrogate you and they're going to say, what's it like being an archaeologist? And your job is to say, it is awesome. It is amazing. It is the best thing you could possibly ever imagine. I am so grateful that I got to do it, that nobody told me to go out and get a real job, that I've lucked into actually doing this sort of stuff. And I'm so thankful. Ask away. And they're going to ask every archaeological question you could possibly imagine. It's your duty and responsibility to watch all the documents so you know what people are watching. So you'll get interrogated on Egypt is a big one. Um, Tutankhamun's um, <laughs> genealogy, you want to get down straight. Uh, the difference between the Aztecs and the Mayans, you want to have that nailed. You want to be able to sort of distinguish that. You want to be able to talk about, um, were they really cannibals over in Europe? <laughs> yeah, apparently, apparently we were, yeah. You know, got a taste for it. <laughs> um, you need to know all this stuff. Um, how many times was England invaded? You know, why did we keep getting invaded? What dumbass bunch? Um, you, but I digress, I digress. It is the best thing. Um, and because it's so popular, even though Peter Hiscock rails against that storm because we're often villains in movies, sometimes. Um, but as we tighten up our words and meanings, we must keep we must keep touch with everyone. We must speak the Queen's English for people who want to go on about other things. Um, and so we come to that wonderful little word, village. Now it's been a problem for ages. Um, as I say, it, it started to get kicked around here a little while ago. And um, I thought, oh, okay, I better get back to the 20th century, middle 20th century Middle East. That's where I better go. So I started looking at that. I thought, oh, man, I can't bother with this. Does anybody know Jack Wilson? Jack, Jack, I need a hand. Uh, I, so Jack became my research assistant. Well, he knew all these people like Kathleen Kenyon and Brainwood and Braidwood and all these people. You know, he's, he knew all these people. So I said, Jack, I need help with this. Go and find me all the stuff that I need. So, you know, you can only work them so hard, but you know, you can, you can do it, you can work a bit. And so, um, there I am delving down, and what do I discover? They're having the same bloody argument. Mid, mid, sort of 50s, 1950s, 1960s. Here we are, same argument. It's a different scale. So they're, they, I'm problematic about villages. Villages, straight through to the keeper. Kathleen Kenyon, walking on top of the village, yeah, it's all cool, they have pottery, they're camping, they're, you know, shit. But then we get to Jericho. <laughs> town, city. So towns and cities, and they're all arguing. They finally tightened all that up. It took them a long time, but they tightened it up. But they weren't really concerned about, about all that. So, you know, um, the village of Hasuna, Kathleen Kenyon notes that there's pottery, but the lowest levels are a camping type, no permanent architecture, only hearths as indications of habitation sites. Well, yeah, but that's because after that, they're all into their mud brick kind of thing, you know? And then mud brick leaves a lot of rubbish around. So no surprise, the mounds get bigger, you know? Um, the size of settlement. 
Well, there is no definition. There is no definition anywhere on size of settlement determining, like Australia. You call those places towns. They're not towns. They're you know they're they're not even villages somewhere. I mean they're tiny little things. You go to the town of Tullamore. There's one park. Really? Come on, you you know. So they're all primitive terms. They're they're just common understandings, and we like to call them towns because we don't want them to feel bad. It's really all you know. You don't want to feel like there's nobody around. Um, but in area, in size of settlement, I thought, well, I better go have a look because pull it swamp to make the GIS and, and forcing all those characters to measure the size of all those mounds. 2.4 hectares in area just at the mounds. So just at the living spaces. Well, shut up, hey, the whole bloody eastern mound, which is all Adobe, you know, so it's like a fake thing, you know, really. Um, the whole thing is 14 hectares, but that's like everything. That's like, you know, the whole thing. Uh, Jericho, three and a half hectares. Come on. Uh, Jericho? It's in the Bible. <laughs> okay, so um, building materials. Oh, look, there's just a map of. Places that I've been talking about that you all know about, everybody knows. This. So then I thought, oh yeah, I better get a map. And then I thought, I'll search for some lidar of the Kanye Plains. But because Turkey unfortunately has Russia, Syria, the Kurds, you know, they're like. <coughs> Well, they're not going to tell you anything that would be of any use to anybody in the case of warfare. And they're in the middle of it. So you don't get any water out of Turkey. But I use the um, SRTM, the digital elevation, uh, very coarse green. And I thought, well, this will do. This will do. And it was. It was quite nice. And I, I haven't put the whole thing in. You know, there's a nice man. See, they can photograph them, but that's only because of all that Adobe. It's just not fair. Uh, so there's the mound there. And I was looking, there's that big lake up there, big swampy lake, and there's a river that comes by here that separates the two things. So it's exactly where it should be. It's in the best real estate in the area, really. And look at that, there's two ponds. So I go to Google Earth. Um, you can't see them. Nobody's ever described them. Uh, there, one of them is largely built over, so it's largely built over now. Um, but I bet you, I bet you, those are the mounds where all the, the brick came out of. Um, so for me, I think I've gone through all that stuff. I'm, I'm a rank environmental, ecological, biological geological determinist. You know, like culture is just the epiphenomenon that, you know, how many buttons you have on your cup, stuff like that. Um, but I've ended up with a social understanding of what a village is. And for me, the definition is the interactions between a larger number of people. It's the everyday comings and goings of the, of the people um, that are relevant, your neighbors, there's snoring, arguing, cooking a meal, bonking. Um, there's kids roaming the streets. There's vacant lots. Like I said, there's a place where you can piss the teenagers off to. Uh, I'm not at all concerned with how long people lived in the village. Here, probably five months of the year. The bulk of the population is here for about five months and then heads off into the back country in the cooler season, wetter seasons. Mixing up your um, resources, not exhausting resources, all those sort of things. But when I look at this, again, this little fiction of um, size of dot according to size of mound, that's not a bad measure of what you would hear. So if I'm living here, you know, I've got all these neighbors, I can give you neighbors. And if you're sociable, you know, you'd like that. This is 
chatting, gossiping, doing stuff. Up there, it's like, like chaos. You know, the teenagers over there. Bit of sort of hobby farm sort of stuff up there. You could spread out. Bit cool, you know. Don't have to listen to too much. Pretty quiet. Um, my good friend Neville Wyman is here. He's antisocial. Um, and you start to think of the place as it's got a distinct range in size, in area, or population. Um, building materials are something to be considered, but we shouldn't be blinded by rubble. They're all found close to swamps, except for the ones that are close to oases in the Middle East. Um, so for me, I will continue to use the term village, uh, in part because we must keep our language plain, in part because I see these settlements as exactly that. Um, and I can think of no other word that describes a social entity and I will not create another word because when I talk to my Barapa colleagues, when I get interrogated across the place by anybody else, if I come up with a, um, now what did the Americans call it? A census designated area. What are they going to say? You know, really? Um, so, I'm going to end, I am going to end. I'm gonna end in just a couple of minutes. But, um, but since we're in Canberra, um, I got this bee in my bonnet about Lake Burley Griffin. Yeah, man-made, but it's a, it's a water body. And it's in poor health, just like all those places that I've been. I never used to be a wetland archeologist. I was just this guy walking around, he looks dry, dusty. You know, there's the streams, you know, there's rivers and stuff, but then the floods come, you know, and you realize, and you're doing all this swamp stuff, you oh gosh, I am, I'm wet, I don't care. Now, this is a man-made one, but what do we hear about it? We hear blue-green algae, bacteria, stinking, carp, development, canalization. Now, these are all symptoms, they're not the disease. And they're symptoms of an unhealthy entity. Um, now we let land developers and engineers plan conservation, and I don't want to slag off either of these professions. Our cities require their efforts. Uh, our cities are big entities, lots of people. Um, but don't design something like the Kingston foreshores and think that the water and the ecology will take care of itself. Like that's like, you know, putting the engineers in charge of Ecology. That's like putting me in charge of bridges. You know, that's not, it's just not a smart thing to do. Um, however, um, is there anything to be done? Well, yes, there is. Give me the key to this dam here. I'll replicate what we're doing. People have foolishly done that. Jamie's not going to be watching this. I have the number two key for national parks. I can go anywhere I bloody well want. <laughs> Give me the key for this. Doesn't have to be the number one key for cameras. Just the number two. Give me the key. I will go and I'll replicate a natural flow, draw the water down. And I would draw the water down one and a half, two meters. From about now, let it draw down into winter, then let it start to come up. You do it year after year, you work out how it all went. Because all those water plants, when the water's high, and you just go to Lake Burley Griffin, I'm down there all the time, that water level doesn't change hardly at all. You can see from the incision, you can, and you can see because I'm down there a lot, that water level doesn't change hardly at all. So there's this narrow little belt of water plants, and the water plants, the reeds, the rushes, they're the home for the, the shrimp, they're the bugs and the shrimp and the little fishies. And then the birds come in and the big fish come in. They're also the kidneys of, this, of the situation which clean the water up. And if you drop the water down, down here, then you have a fair bit of ground and all those water plants establish themselves and then the water comes up and they're all growing with water 
So a lot of those plants, and they'll find their own level. But combine you, uh, bull rock, because it's way out here. And all this pink, would that be an agenda? Is that what you call agenda? Like, it is. Whatever it is. But it, all that is about one and a half, two meter mark. And if I had my way, that would be what the place would look like. Uh, sadly, we sacrificed this whole area of reed bed, but you'd have extensive reed beds in places where you have bugger all right now. And you would try to expand that as much as you have as you can, uh, ultimately ending up with possibly 25% of the lake being reed bed. Uh, that's my plan. Now, uh, I'm, I am a naive optimist, and um, I would like to think that this would go. What I do know is that none of these problems have gone away with any other policy, and I bothered to look through some of the literature and environment, like the status in government departments, environment in all Lake Road and River sites down here, right, second to the bottom. Um, so where we are is, just to finish, 10 years ago, uh, where we are at the Murray-Darling Basin Authority set a target of getting native fish communities back to 60% or better of their pre-European settlement date by about 2053. How are you going to do that with 80% of the water currently being pulled out for irrigation, 10% being used for delivery of that 8%, 5% just being stolen, maybe 5% is left? You might also ask whether anybody knows what that pre-European state was. We're beyond a policy that seeks to restore the health of the Murray River floodplain. We've seen the Darling River be killed. Uh, and don't think that this last little bit of water coming down is, everything's fine now, everything's great, you know? There's water. Oh, Menindee Lake has fish in it, great. They're all going to die because they're not going to get out. They're all going to die. Um, and when we go back into dry, this next drought, all those little fish, they're going to die. Because I went and I measured some of the water bodies along the Darling River in 2019. And we were one year away from those all going. And then the little fish go. Um, so I think our success at one small, small swamp has showed that conservation must be local. It must be interventionist. It must be bottom up. It's not sufficient to fill the bath up as quickly as possible and then walk away. Um, a small amount of arithmetic shows that when we need environmental water flows, we will never have enough for large scale floods envisaged. That flooding that whole forest that they spent $140 million building a gold plated levee around that they will never operate because it will never work. Um, when we do have enough water to provide big amounts of environmental water allocations, um, it's irrelevant because there's going to be that enough water that there's water's just there, it just doesn't need a name. The policy of securing water savings to benefit environment has been well intentioned, even if masking the construction of a water distribution grid that facilitates the economics of land prices and economics. That's currently going on. Um, so my concerns remain fame firmly down in the swamp. Although I talked about Canberra, um, larger discussions, lobbying between industry and conservation, that'll take places in Canberra, but I'll stay in the swamp. My insistence on using the term intellectual property rights of the Barapa embodied in their archeological record is pointed um, because it's what led us there. It's what has shown us how we can go and uh, do successful little bits of conservation that might actually keep. These are really just aquariums, right? All we're talking about is aquariums. We're talking about a big, but you know, small in the scheme of things. As many of those as we can get, a couple of gigaliters of water for each, we deliver water into just to keep all those little fish and everything that goes with them, keep them alive until this society crumbles and then things go back.
to as was. Um, just keep them alive through our lifetime so that, so that people like me don't have to sit there and when my grandkids say, oh, Grandpa, what did you do to save the, save the planet when, um, when you were working? I don't want to be sitting there saying, oh, like, fuck off. You know? So the small scale, um, but I think it works. I think government agencies are starting to turn their policies and the Barapa would like to be involved. They'd like to participate. They'd like some stay in land and water stewardship. They'd like a bit of longer term work for people. And so that's where I want to end today. Uh, and I think uh, I had that just to scare everybody. That's the kind of monitoring you need to do, which is scary, but it works. That's what, that's, that's the water, that's the water, that's the water network of this whole Murray Basin, right? So that's an engineering point of view. And currently the whole plan is to move the water as quickly as possible down to other lands. Oh, it didn't work. I had this great um, ending. I see the light. Couldn't be mother Twenty years <laughs> Do you think we'll make it? I so said to myself Do you think we'll make it? I said to myself